Okay, so we've seen the suffix tree, and we've seen the suffix array, and they have some sort of relationship. We have some idea that they have some relationship. But in this video, we're going to go deeper into the relationship and sort of see how inside the suffix array, we can recover information about the suffix tree. So, okay, so again, we sort of already know that there's some relationship between the suffix tree and the suffix array. Uh, for example, we learned that one of the ways that we can build the suffix array is to traverse the suffix tree, right? We said we can traverse the suffix tree, and if we're careful to make sure that when we are visiting the children of an internal node, that we always visit them in alphabetical order. And if we do it that way and we traverse the whole tree, then the order in which we arrive in the leaves, right, the, the leaf labels, if we read them off in order, equal the elements of the suffix array. So there was that, that relationship at least, but I'm going to sort of further the relationship and say um, both of them, in some sense, encode trees. Okay, so in the case of the suffix tree, it's pretty explicitly a tree, right? It's called a tree. We draw it like a tree, and, uh, you know, the nodes of the tree have the normal parent-child tree relationships. Well, there's sort of no escaping the fact that a suffix tree is a tree. But a suffix array is not visibly a tree, it is an array. However, when we go to search the suffix array, we are treating it a bit like a tree, in the sense that we're taking our query, we're comparing it to the midpoint, and we're asking whether our query is greater than or less than the pivot, the midpoint, and recursing. And in that way, we're essentially traversing a binary search tree. So we can actually picture, like uh, here I've explicitly put the picture of the binary search tree right there on top of the suffix array. Um, so in some sense, they both encode trees. Um, so that's another way in which they're related. And in this lecture, we're going to go a bit deeper. As we already knew, the suffix array can be built from the suffix tree. But in a way, we can go the other way, too. We can build the suffix tree from the suffix array. The suffix tree is somehow hiding, embedded there inside the suffix array. And we're going to see explicitly how that is the case today. Okay, so back to our example suffix array here. Uh, we've been working with this example for the last few videos. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to do we already saw what LCEs are, longest common extensions. These are essentially, you know, the, the longest common prefix between two different suffixes. Um, we're going to pre-compute a bunch of these LCEs, specifically the LCEs between adjacent elements of the suffix array. Okay, so between every sort of adjacent pair of elements in the suffix array, we're going to pre-compute and record the LCE. So let's write down empty spaces for the array that's going to get these LCEs. Here it is here. And we can start with the first pair of suffixes. These two have no prefix in common. Right? So the longest common prefix between those two is length 0, so I would put a 0 in there. And now we go to the next two. These two actually have a nice long one, right? So this one starts with ABRAC, and this one starts with ABRAD. So that ABRA is in common, so I would put 4 as the LCE in that element. Okay, so 0, 4, and I can keep going. This one gets a 1, their LCE is 1, their LCE is 1, their LCE is 2, and so on. And I can fill in this entire LCE array like this. You can see that the elements of the LCE array are a little sort of staggered relative to their uh, counterparts in the suffix array, but that's because we're, of course, combining these adjacent pairs of suffix array items to get the LCE array items. One more thing I have to tell you about this LCE array that we're going to build is we're actually going to sort of give it these bookend elements. We're going to put elements on either extreme that are extra, and, you know, there's no, we, we don't uh, have a number particular number to put in those elements because there are no two adjacent suffixes that can be compared at those extremes, we're just going to give them a kind of default placeholder value of negative 1. And that's going to be useful in, in the future when we write down some definitions of what it is we're uh, interested in and looking for in this array. <laughs> 
So we just add on these bookends. They're both equal to negative one. We now have a pre-computed LCE array. It's parallel to the suffix array, like maybe shifted by one, but parallel to the suffix array. And the notion of LCE is familiar to us from the previous couple of lectures. So now we're ready to define the internal structure that the suffix array has that tells us something about the suffix tree. Right? We said earlier we can get the suffix tree from the suffix array. In order to understand how we get the suffix tree from the suffix array, we have to understand that the suffix array has some kind of structure inside. And we're going to be able to talk about that structure by using both the suffix array and the LCE array. Okay, so now I need to define an important, um, an important part of the suffix array called an L interval. Okay, so certain intervals of the suffix array are special. They're L intervals. And to understand which intervals of the suffix array are L intervals, we have to look not just at the suffix array, but also at this LCE array, right? Because the way we're going to define them, it's a function of the elements in the LCE array that are alongside, that are parallel to the elements of the suffix array. Okay, so let's look at the definition. So an interval of the suffix array from i to j is an L interval if the following three properties all hold. Okay, so here come three separate properties. Property one, the LCEs to either side of that interval of the suffix array have to be less than L. Okay, so what do I mean by LCEs on either side? And now, now we have to go back to the picture and remember that in, in the picture, the suffix array is sort of staggered with respect to the LCE array. That actually makes it easier to understand what I mean when I say to either side. All right, so let's just imagine for a moment an interval of the suffix array. Let's take this interval right here, like that. Okay, that's an interval of the suffix array, right? Uh, from there to there. And if we were to refer to the LCEs on either side, quote unquote, we're referring to the one sort of like just off the left, this one, and the one just off the right, that one, right? So they sort of, the LCEs that bookend the interval in the suffix array. Okay, so that's what we mean by to either side. Okay, so property one says that the LCEs to either side have to be less than L. The second property says at least one of the LCEs within the interval has to be equal to L. And then the third property says all the other LCEs that are in the interval have to be greater than L. Okay. So these three properties combine to define an L interval. They have to all be true. Notice a couple of things. First of all, um, because the LCEs to either side have to be less than L, and because the LCEs within the interval have to be greater than or equal to L, if you combine properties two and three, then that's a little bit like we entered a portion of the LCE array where we came you know, the value went up, you know, we were sort of low and then became higher. Now we're at least L. And then as long as we stay in the L interval, we're still at least L. And then boop, we come back down to less than L. So you can see an L interval sort of defines something that's popping up out of the background of lower LCE values to either side. But notice another thing too, which is although it, what I said, or you know, I said, all the LCEs in the interval have to be greater than or equal to L. This is true, but requirements two and three, properties two and three, say something a little bit stronger than that. Not only do all of the LCEs in the interval have to be greater than or equal to L, but at least one of them has to be exactly equal to L. Okay? So just keep those in mind as we think about what uh, as we work with L intervals going forward. Okay, so now that we have defined L intervals and, and built up a little bit of intuition about them, let's go hunting for them in our suffix array, okay? So there's our definition. I sort of put it in a box at the bottom, and I brought back our, our suffix array and LCE array all filled in. So we ought to be able to 
apply these properties and see if we can find an LCE array, uh, L, I'm sorry, an L interval in our suffix array. So, okay, how about, let me highlight one right there. That's actually the same one I circled earlier when I was talking about what it meant to say LCEs to either side. So there we go, we have an interval of the suffix array inside that blue rectangle. And we can see that it is an L interval. Specifically, it's an L interval with L equal to one. Right, so I called it a one interval. One interval meaning L interval, but with L equal to one, right? Okay, so that's a one interval. Let's just check the three properties. First of all, the LCEs to either side have to be less than L. So is that true? Yeah, well, L is one, it's a one interval which means that the LCEs to either side have to be less than one, and indeed they are both zero. So that checks out. Okay, second requirement, at least one of the LCEs within the interval, right, meaning in this part here, right, at least one of the LCEs within the interval has to be equal to L, and L is one. So is that satisfied? Yes, these two elements in the interval are both equal to one, so that satisfies property two, even if there'd only been one of them in the interval that would also have satisfied property two. So property two is satisfied. And now all the other LCEs in the interval other than one, right, so that means, you know, this one and this one and this one, those are the other ones that are within the interval, those have to be greater than one, and they are. Okay, so they're all three satisfied. So that, let me go back and highlight it again, that really is a one interval. Okay, so we found an L interval, specifically a one interval in our suffix array. Uh, okay, let's, let's sort of um, look around, see if, do we see any other one intervals? I mean, there's definitely some other one intervals. So just like, for example, I think I see one over here, right, these three, from there to there. And I say that's a one interval because the LCEs on either side are zeros, so that's less than one. One of the LCEs within the interval is equal to one, and the other LCE within that interval is greater than one. So I think that's another one interval. And I can use the color coding here to show you how the three properties are satisfied by that one interval. Okay, but there's not just one intervals in this suffix array, there are other kinds of L intervals. We can also look for L intervals with L not equal to one. For example, let's look for a two interval. Do you think you see one? Sort of poke around in there. I think I see at least one, right? So like here's one right here. That's a two interval. I say it's a two interval because again, all three properties are satisfied. First of all, the LCEs to either side have to be less than two. And in this case, they are zero and one. So those are both less than two. This is the first instance where we've seen an example where the L interval is bookended by LCEs that are different, right? In this, you know, zero and one. However, it's okay that they're different. The only requirement, according to our definition, is that they be less than L. And they're both less than L. And then we have a two in there and we have something greater than two in there. So that's a two interval. There's another two interval. There's another two interval. There's a lot of intervals in here, L intervals in the suffix array at various levels. Okay. Okay, there's even a, a zero interval. Right, do you see the zero interval? Yeah, it's the whole thing, right? The whole thing is a zero interval because it's bookended by negative ones, right? And that's, that's important. That's why we put those negative one bookends on either side. So we have intervals of various values of L, zero, one, two, three. And, um, and some of them are contained inside others. Okay, so now that we have this definition and now that we know how to go hunting and for and finding these L intervals in the suffix array, why, why, why do we care? It must be that these L intervals correspond to something in the suffix tree, right? Because that's the whole purpose of why we're looking at these things. We need to, we're trying to find, you know, structure and patterns inside the suffix array that in turn tell us something about the suffix tree. So what do these L intervals correspond to in terms of the suffix tree? Well, they correspond to the internal nodes of the suffix tree. So every L interval in the suffix array corresponds to some 
internal node in the suffix tree. Okay, so just as an example, let's picture the suffix tree again. Here's the suffix tree on the right hand side of this diagram here. And let's picture one of the L intervals from the suffix array. I'm just sort of, I sort of extracted one of the L intervals. This happens to be a two interval from the suffix array. And I depicted the part of the suffix array that is that constitutes the two interval. And I also extracted the part of the LCE array that overlaps with that two interval. Okay. And so if we look at that two interval on the left, and we look at that suffix tree on the right, we ought to be able to find which internal node it corresponds to. Okay. So which internal node does that correspond to? That's not so hard, right? Because we can just look directly at the suffixes. I, I did draw out the suffixes, right? So we can see that these are the suffixes that start with AD. Uh, and we've got three of them. And we can also just look at the numbers in the boxes and say, well, okay, these are the suffixes whose, that go to leaves that are labeled with 12, 5, and 10. That's another way we can look at it. And that should direct us, that should direct our attention to a certain part of the suffix tree. And I think you could probably figure out that it corresponds to this part of the suffix tree. Right? We sort of had two different ways of, of thinking about it. Like we could have started at the leaves and said, okay, well, that's the part of the tree that has exactly those three leaves. Or we could have started with the common prefix of AD and sort of walked down like this and said, okay, well, everything under there must be in our two interval. And so you can see in this case, our two interval from the suffix array corresponds to an internal node of the suffix tree, this internal node, that one. It would be sort of equivalent if we said that it corresponds to a subtree of the suffix tree, right? Kind of same thing, right? That interval contains the suffixes at offsets 12, 5, and 10, and those constitute the three suffixes in that subtree of the suffix tree. You can sort of think of it either way. Okay, so this particular two interval corresponds to that internal node. Notice something else here that internal node is at depth two, right? It's at depth two. We can think of that as its label depth, right? Because this edge is labeled A, this edge is labeled D. Or we can think of it as its like node depth, right? The sort of traditional notion of depth in a tree because it's two hops down from the root regardless of the edge labels. Anyway, either way, it's at depth two, corresponding to the fact that this is a two interval, two interval means not only does it correspond to an internal node, it corresponds to an internal node at depth two. Okay, so this, this two interval corresponds to that internal node, that subtree. How about this one? Here's a one interval, and we can use the same trick. We can look at it and say, okay, well, that should have the leaves labeled 13, 6, and 11 under it, or <clears throat> we can look at the common prefix. In this case, the common prefix is D, Either way, I guess that's sort of taken us to this node in the suffix tree, right? Because that's the node that has the suffixes 13, 6, and 11 underneath it. It's also the node whose label is D, the common. So that one interval corresponds to that internal node. That internal node, again, is at depth one. Okay. So one intervals are at the label depth of one, two intervals are at the label depth of two, etc. Okay, if this relationship holds, then I guess we should be able to look at a perspective, a sort of potential one interval from the suffix array. And if it corresponds to an internal node, then I guess that means it really is an L interval. But if it does not correspond to an internal node in the suffix tree, I guess it's not really a one int uh, uh, an L interval. And so we can sort of use the suffix tree side to kind of double check that our properties make sense. So in this example, I've got this sort of potential interval here, and I'm asking, is it a uh, one interval or not? And so let's look at where it sort of lives with respect to the suffix tree. And let's do this by suffix this time. So let's look at these suffixes. This is the suffix labeled 3, 12, 5, 10. And here they are down here, 3, 12, 5, 10. 
okay? And so what you see about those leaves is, sure, they're all there. They're all there in the sepix tree. But they're not in a, they're not, they don't make up a subtree of the sepix tree, right? Like, uh, for three to be in the subtree, that would have to mean that the internal node, the corresponding internal node would have to be this one or a higher one. But these, these leaves are not, maybe I should use a different color, these leaves are not one of the ones in our interval and therefore that wouldn't really work. In other words, that particular interval doesn't really correspond to any of the internal nodes of the suffix tree. It's sort of a mashed together version of two internal nodes of the suffix tree, but it's not sort of perfect. Um, and so correspondingly, we can see also that it's not really a one interval, not according to our definition of a one interval, because, for example, property one is violated because there's a, the flanking LCE on the left is not less than one, right? It's equal to one. Okay, so that's sort of an example where something that doesn't work with, with respect to our L interval definition also doesn't work because it doesn't correspond on the suffix tree side because it doesn't really correspond to an internal node. So now that we know there is this correspondence between the L intervals in the suffix array and the internal nodes of the suffix tree, we can go a bit further because we also can understand the relationships between the nodes in the suffix tree. In other words, the suffix array also gives us, <clears throat> you know, the sort of connectivity information between the internal nodes of the suffix tree, which ultimately allows us to even traverse the suffix tree using only the L intervals from the suffix array. So let's see, for example, let's go back to our, our, our view of this zero interval, the one that's inclusive of um, uh, all of the suffix array. That corresponds to, I guess, the root node of the suffix tree, right? So the zero interval corresponds to the root of the suffix tree. But the next thing I wanna point out is that not only does that correspond to the root of the suffix tree, but there is information in that zero interval about the edges that are coming off the node, the uh, root of the suffix tree. Specifically, if you look in that zero interval, right, remember that property two said it is a requirement that some elements of the interval, the middle part of the interval, be equal to L. And in this example, that means they have to be equal to zero. And we can see there are five elements that are equal to zero. And you can think of those five uh, elements of the zero interval that are equal to zero as partitioning the zero interval into six parts, right? There's five zeros, they partition it into something like six parts, right? This part, the part in between these two, the part in between these two, that little bit there, right? These parts, right? It sort of partitions it into those six parts. And those six partitions correspond to the root node's six children. So if we were to move along this zero interval, jumping sort of from zero to zero as we go, then that would in essence be like traversing the children of the root node. So to just visualize this a bit, what we're saying is, I guess the elements of the L interval that are equal to L are, are sort of, their, their sort of meaning is that they're they're like little journeys from edge to edge, right? They're, they're, every time there's a zero, we're moving in a zero interval. Every time there's a zero in a zero interval, we're moving from edge to edge, from edge to edge along the suffix tree. So, um, for example, that zero is like moving from the edge labeled dollar to moving to the edge labeled A. And that zero is like moving from the edge labeled A to the edge labeled BRA. And this one, so on, right? Each of these is like a hop from one edge to the next. In other words, inside this zero interval, there are a bunch of nested other intervals, right? So if the L intervals correspond to internal nodes and the LCEs that are equal to L correspond to sort of turnovers between the children, in other words, you can think of them as partitioning the L interval into the parts that belong to its children, the child nodes, then if we wanted to traverse the tree, like if we wanted to visit the root first, but then we wanted to visit the root's children, then we could do that because the zero interval is nicely divided into the parts that correspond to the children. 
right? So that little bit there, just from the leftmost, from the negative one to the zero, corresponds to that first child. That was the one labeled dollar sign. We'll see it again in a moment because I'm going to switch back to showing you the tree. But that little thing there uh, was one of the children. This longer one interval is the next child. This shorter three interval is the next child, and so on. Right, so the children are in there as L intervals for L greater than zero, but that are nested within the zero interval. Right, so they're in there. Okay, so let's bring the picture back. So these, these intervals that I've highlighted here, and I particularly highlighted the four that are non-trivial, right, because they actually have more than one child underneath them. Right, so the uh, one interval here corresponds to the internal node here. The three interval here corresponds to the internal node here, which happens to be at label depth three, which is why it's a three interval. Uh, and then one interval, two interval corresponding to these two. So if we wanted to traverse the suffix tree, but using only our L interval information, we could do it because we could look at this zero interval, find its constituent smaller intervals, these ones that I've highlighted here, and then we can just recurse, right? We can recursively visit one of those child intervals and do the same thing there, right? So if we recurse on this uh, interval here, which is a one interval corresponding to this internal node, well, again, now we can look inside there and look for intervals that are, um, you know, L intervals for L greater than one. And the way we would do that would be to jump from one to one within this L interval, right? So if we look inside that one interval, we find a constituent four interval and two interval corresponding to these two children, and we can recurse. And you get, you get the impression that what we can do here is by looking at the nested structure of the L intervals in the suffix array, we can traverse the suffix tree, okay, and so on. Okay. So in order to do this, though, in order to actually perform this traversal, we need to be able to make these jumps. Like, we need not just to be able to identify an L interval, but we need to quickly traverse, sort of be able to jump quickly along the L interval from sort of pillar to pillar. I sort of think of them as a bit like pillars, right, which are the elements inside the interval that are equal to L. Right? So we need to be able to jump from element to element that's equal to L, you know, efficiently. And so there is literature that describes how to do this. One idea is to use sort of pre-computation. Another idea is to use a combination of rank minimum queries and super Cartesian trees. These are topics that are a little too detailed for me to go into in these videos, but I've given you a couple of reference he references here so that you can see in more depth how you could build data structures that allow you to do this jumping from child to child very efficiently. But I hope that overall what you've gotten is this strong impression that the suffix array, together with this little bit of additional LCE information, really does encode the full complexity and structure of the suffix tree. And we indeed can basically use the suffix array as an alternate way of representing this. We can, of course, turn it back into the suffix tree if we want to. But we can also just keep it a suffix array, but use it as an alternate way of representing the branching structure of the suffix tree so that we could traverse the suffix tree without explicitly building it.